Hi, my name is Gavin O'Connor. I'm the director of Miracle, and I was asked to introduce this portion of our DVD, which I accepted proudly. What you're about to see is very raw footage of Herb Brooks. A few weeks before we started pre-production, we met in a hotel in Los Angeles and spent a marathon session as Herb walked us through his philosophies to the game, his approach to the sport, and his method to his madness. Uh, we lost Herb this past summer, and we thought it was important to include this footage as a tribute to the man who inspired this film and whose story we wanted to tell correctly. I hope you enjoy it. How difficult was it when, when you did cut Cox? Remember that? that? It, it killed that that moment. There's two emotional moments for me. That one and then after. That was the emotional. The easy thing to do is send your assistant to it or post them. Post them, but you know, I had to do it eyeball to eyeball. You know, it was very. You know, I, I told a few people the story that when I dropped out of the university tryout for. The only thing that my dad's a stay in school study, you're not know American study, stay in school study, I gotta find out, blah, blah, blah. So I dropped out. And and uh, I was a junior at the university and I dropped out. And I, all of a sudden, there's hundreds of guys in training camp between Boston and Minnesota. And all of a sudden, I'll go, I'll go fast forward on the story. Every day that the coach says, hey, bring your playbook, I want to talk to you. Uh, I phoned my father and said, Dad, I'm still here. Dad, I'm still here. Dad, I'm still here. Now six months go by. We play a lot of games through Europe, North America, and what have you. Every day I call my dad. Now we're two days before the Olympics in, in Squaw Valley. And we're playing the Czech Olympic team in Denver. And I'm rooming with Tommy Williams, the, the best young American player. And, his, and, and he and I were the youngest along with him. And was a couple years old, Billy Christian in the world, but Tommy went right there to play the Boston Bruins in six teams. Okay, that's how good he was. And I don't, I don't unpack my bags. And Tommy says, hey, Herb, you made it. more goals and sis relaxed. Ah, Tommy, killing me, you know. And all of a sudden, I see knock on the door. The gentleman asked to go see the coach. And by the way, from the playbook, I said, let's see Coach Riley. And he says, all right, let's get a release you. And, uh, and this is a true story, though, and, and it just, it's amazing. And I said, well, Coach, I got more goals, sister, I think can help you out. Tell me, see, you've been fine, but I got to go with an older team, and you and Tommy are the youngest guys. And I got to just, you know, go with more experience. And now I got to go make a call to my father. So I called and I said, Dad, this whole thing is bull. It's the Eastern coach, all fixed all politics. And I went through the whole thing and finally, you know, vented myself, and there must have been five minutes or so, I'm yapping. My father said, you're done? I said, yeah. He said, well, I keep your bleeping. He said, keep your mouth shut. I heard enough of that. So you get back and thank the coach, get your ass in the locker room, wish your teammates well, and get your ass home. That was my father, God rest his soul. I said, yes, sir. So I came home, I watched this thing unfold, and the, and the Soviets were just coming to power. The Canadians were the team to beat their favorite. The Americans got hot. And they won our country's first gold medal. I'm watching the same on TV. My father looked over at me. Kurt, he says, looks like the coach cut the right guy, didn't he? Just bang him. You know, looks like the coach cut the right guy. Keep your mouth shut and blah, blah, blah. And he says, you know, there's other Olympic teams. You know, and, and, and I use this phrase, and it goes right back to then. You want to make sacrifices for the unknown. All right? And I've given this phrase to Mike time after time, and it was a key thing. And I tell our guys, there's the unknown. You have to make sacrifices for the unknown. We're going there. There's going to be sacrifices for this thing, guys. And I'm pounding this thing all the time. Don't give me your time. Don't give me this. This is a sacrifice. We're going there. So, and my father said, you want to make sacrifices for the unknown? Well, I played a couple Olympic games. We didn't win any medals. We had good American teams, you know. And... So now I go back to the Ralph Cox thing. Now I got to send him home where I've been in, and it was killed. I, I knew that day was coming, and I just, I didn't know how to have it. just killed me. But I knew I had to do it eyeball to eyeball, and I couldn't take it easy out. 
There's yeah. a difference between a method and madness and maniacal. He's a maniac, but there's a, yeah. a reason for it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that some of the There's a reason guys, for it, and the reason is that they're being held. But I, I think there's a difference between being held to your highest standard, because yeah. that, as a player, you know that. It's inside, you know all he's trying to really do is make me play my best. And the problem is, if I really answer this test truthfully, is I don't like to push myself that hard yeah. all the time. A lot of these guys being college All-Americans, they were never pushed like that, never pulled. And I wasn't trying to put greatness into anybody. I was trying to pull it out, pull it out way up here. And I don't like coaches that try to put it in because they think they've got all the answers. But you got to believe in them, uh, have high standards uh, of them, and pull it out. And my favorite coach, John Wooden right here, I think he would concur with that. For me, it was the loneliest year I've ever had in coaching. I was uh, very aloof uh, by design. Uh, the easiest thing to, to do would be to get involved in them and everything else. But I was aloof and I was I did my job. My assistant, Craig Packer, said, hey, put the white hat on your other buddies. And I just, you know, I came and did my job and left. What, how, how bad did you want the shop? When you well, wanted it back, you did. Oh, no question. I didn't want to just stay at the University of Minnesota. I went to the University of Minnesota to hope to coach an Olympic team. That's what I, that was my passion. I'd find out where the Soviets were practicing. And they used to have closed practice, and they'd say they're practicing A and they'd be at B. Couldn't find them. They were very, very dark. <laughs> but I'd show up and I'd watch them, and, and he would know that I was really interested in all the things they were doing. This is when you were... You, you, I was still at the University of Minnesota and getting ready for the Olympics. And then the World Championship 79, we tied the checks with all these young kids. Tied the checks 2-2 in Moscow. He's waiting for me after the game. Give me a great big go to Soviet bear hugs, you know, and comrade this. Because he saw what we were trying to do. He was a real sportsman. He was trying to... <laughs> see the bigger picture. See a bigger picture. Yeah. He was very open about a whole, preaching a new gospel of what was happening. And he was the father, he was probably more than anybody that changed the whole game of the world, this guy. And when I interviewed for the job, I, I told the Olympic Committee in the best way I could that we can't be the same old, same old, same old style of play, how we're going to think. All they used to do is take these great college athletes and go play college hockey again, raise a lot of money for the, the Olympic team, then they go to the Olympic Games and get whacked. I said, we got to change this whole thing. We, it, I said, what you have, if you have competition without preparation, there's no development. We had to develop these people. So I said, we'll go play three college games to get some money and the rest. I put them in deep water. And then we <clears throat> did a lot of things in, in, through our training that was getting them out of that comfort zone, psychological comfort zone, physiological comfort zone. <coughs> so I thought this, this hockey club was the best conditioned hockey club outside the Soviets in the world. First of all, I would say, how can we, how will we be successful? Right. Okay, will we be successful playing a North American game in the Olympics, a North American style in the Olympics against the great uh, Europeans? No, I mean it's been proven. So I'm, I'm saying that I got to steal a little bit. I got to steal. What, what's, what makes the Soviets so great, or the Czechs, or the Swedes, or all the great Europeans? And as I said, out of the top ten scorers in the National Hockey League right now, nine of them are Europeans. Okay, what makes them great? style of play, tremendous conditioning. So what, what every time you play the great European teams, and they'll, you play for them a, a period two, you hit the wall and die. Right. Can't keep up. Yeah. So we weren't going to hit the wall. Did you have an idea uh, going into the, the festival that there were certain guys that you knew were probably going to make this team? Oh yeah, you did. Yes. Because if I hadn't, and then my year and a half of research was, right. uh, I wasn't doing. I wasn't very smart. Yeah. I had a good idea, but there were some some guys in there that were coming along. I was Rizzioni. I wasn't know if he could play, because right. uh, I I knew him a little bit and tracked him a little bit. I wanted to see how he was doing in this environment, you know, because he was fired by not our best hockey player. You know? Yeah, he was a great guy, and a good leader, and that type of thing. So there were some guys that. Uh, that uh, came out of the woodwork, yeah. And there were some guys that, uh, you know, some of the guys at least I had in Minnesota, I knew were flat out couldn't play. The, the team building thing with the Olympic team, I knew had to be big because that had to be. So we had to overcome all these obstacles with 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 enthusiasm, with a comradeship, with a great morale in a locker room. Yeah, they had talent. Yes, they were extremely young, 
but the team building thing was very important for us. Okay, and and I was there, and I and you know worked their tail off, and they had to do. They had to reinvent themselves a lot. They had to reinvent themselves. They had to reinvent themselves. Their training was different, uh, more intense. Uh, the style of play was entirely different from whatever they had played before, because we were now more of a hybrid type of team between the Europeans and, and, and the Canadians. But the, so they had to reinvent themselves, and they only could do this with a. They had a good have a good person uh, a good personal attitude. Plus, they had to be in an environment where 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 it was uh, conducive to team building. The players that we had, they were well-rounded players that could adapt to a whole new style of play. Right. Okay? More of an interchangeable style of play and all that sort of stuff. So they were very well-rounded and they're really tough psychologically. They were hard-bitten, tough people and that could be pulled and at times pushed but mostly pulled and understood that, great, do it again, you know, and they had a tremendous mental resilience. They were tough, tough young people. Try to keep them all on the bubble as long as possible. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to give anybody the thing that, hey, I played this hockey club. I played my games with Jimmy Craig uh, right up into the end, right? We were playing the Soviets right in Madison Square Garden one day before the, the Lake Placid. I said, Jimmy, and I knew I had to tweak him again. And he was playing well, but I was going to say, it was a mind thing with him. I said, Jimmy, I'm done. He said, what do you mean? I said, I played you too long, your curveball is hanging, not your fault. My fault. I see elements in your game, you're playing tired. My fault, Jimmy. And he says, What? I said, I gotta play Janicek here half the game and I wanna give him some work because I, I just see some flaws now. And I'm kicking myself, Jimmy, it's not your fault. I, I played you too long. And he said, It's my job, I'll show you you dirty blah blah blah. Right. So halfway through that game I yanked him. I yanked him. Yeah. Right there in front of 18,000 masks when he came and he was livid. Okay? That was my last tweak with this guy. I knew what I had. And solid goalkeeper, but maintenance guy. All right? Because he, you know, I mean, if I didn't talk to him, I don't know how much the team talked to me. But anyway, uh, we go right in and, and I start Craig and I played him right through. Right through. Because I know it's, it's that he's, he just is that. But, Right after, right after we won it, right to me with a finger in my she said, I showed you, didn't I? I showed you, didn't I? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> you got a story. I said, you sure did, Jimmy. I said, did a hell of a job, kid. <laughs> we just came off of just getting our ass kicked in Madison Square Garden. What was it? 10 one or something by the Soviets. 10-3. So we had to come back. I just said, hey. I talked to our doctor, I talked to our, our assistant coach, I said, hey, I got something, I got to shake these boys up. I mean, they're, they're frozen heavily. So it just so happened, McClanahan, who I had been with for four years, and I know this kid, I know his family, and I know what buttons the press with this kid. And uh, so I took the tough road, and, and he had the bad things. Yeah, it's too bad, Rob. It's a long way from the heart, kid. So I can't, can't sit down and sit down. Stand up. <laughs> you know? Holy crap, he's after me, and it was the whole locker room. <laughs> it's a true story. And it was a, I mean, it could have gone the other way, too. And I could have shut myself up. I'm just saying that's what happened. And, and uh, well, that's what's so amazing, man. But saying. I did this, I talked to the doctor about it. I said, Can he get hurt worse? No. Right. He's got a bad hematoma. Can he play? It's going to hurt like you know, fire. As so I said, a long way from the heart. You know, so, so Robbie just goes goofy and, and the, play, the whole locker room wakes up and, and I sort of walked out and winked at Craig Patrick, assistant coach. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. <laughs> if you get a shot of that, you get a shot at the plan and stands up the whole game. He couldn't sit down. And he played. He played like hell. He's a hell of a player. Jack O'Callaghan, when he tore up his knee, mm. and he's in, in Mass Square Garden, he, I could have just said, God, I'll bring somebody else in. But he was very important to that chemistry, okay? He was a very charismatic guy, a spirit at the National Anthem, if I have to, you know? <laughs> and, he, and, and I was, I used him in a sense, that's another little mind game, you know, the, the story when I, I, the whipping boy thing, mm -hmm. I know what I was I thought I knew what I was doing, and he was a bright kid, went to BU, could have gone to Harvard, a bright, tough, 
uh, and, and someone I knew I could trust and yet I didn't know. So I told him the story. Now listen, I knew how to, and I said, when I say OC, okay, I'm yapping at you and all the message goes to everybody. I was on his ass. OC this, OC that, and he was, man, when I, but if I say Jack, you know I'm unhappy with you. I said, you know, he, he took it, he stood it, and now guys say, oh, Frank Sherb's on OC today. Holy, oh, he see that his ass today. <laughs> and then he would, he was so good, he would <coughs> ratchet it up and, and do a little more and this and that and handle the thing. But it just was part of a team building thing, okay? I could have, I could have probably picked this team in July and I'd been real close. I knew who these guys were, but I wasn't going to let anybody know, let alone the players. And if you declare yourself, now all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you got a pro team. Yeah, they said, well, I got this team made or whatever. I kept them on the bubble. That's a key thing. I kept them on the bubble, and there's a lot of different ways to keep everything. I told you what I do with Jimmy Craig right there. He was on the bubble. I kept Jimmy Craig on the bubble right the day before. So there's a lot of different ways they kept them on the bubble to keep this up. Some were good and some I, I probably would do over. Okay? But that was the map. Yeah, yeah. I walked by guys and maybe, you know, not, I didn't say, hey, how's your, how's your mom and dad, how's this, how's it, anything I can do for you? Right. Oh, yeah, that's fine. Might have read something about my skating them after a game. Yes. yes. And you just don't do that. Right. And we were playing with our legions. And the guys wanted their time, and they were a bunch of individuals, and they were listening to their agents, and they were going to turn pro, and they are pissing and moaning and bickering. And I said, oh. Well, so I got to draw a line in the sand right away. Well, what did they do in the ice that game? Well, oh, they, did, they didn't take them serious. They were not respectful to the opposition. They didn't play with the necessary intensity, with or without the puck, offensively, defensively. You know, they just sort of took a night off. So, I said, I told him before, he said, we get a good workout now, or we'll get it after the game. <laughs> I said, oh, you know, no one's ever done that. Well, I did. Would I do it again? Oh, boy, I don't know. I probably not. I mean, I, that was one of the things that you like to have a tape back, you know. Right, right. <laughs> but it's but, interesting because it, well, from my research, I've learned that a lot of the guys say that that was one of the moments that they sort of crystallized the realization that it's us against him. Yeah, there's been a lot of those. <laughs> that I think I think that was that was not so much us against me in the sense other than holding them to that standard. But that, I don't think that was that was a moment where they understood that they got to come to work and bust their ass and whatever they whatever talent they had had to come out. I wasn't going to give them a night off. I wasn't not going to let them just. Uh, well, it's okay, boys. We had one of those games. No, I wasn't. Every day was important in the building. But I wasn't going to give them a day off and I was going to hold them to high standards. That was the, I think that's what they took out of that. Say, hey, we better, sh we better show up here and bust our ass. The story of Kenny Murray shows up in the training camp with a beard. I look around, I didn't want any beards. He had a beard nobody else did. But then I started sewing, other guys started growing beards. <laughs> so, I said, well, okay. so I said, guys, about these beards, here's the rules. Whoever showed up with a beard can keep one. <laughs> That's fine. The guys looked around. I said, Kenny, you showed up. This is you, and if you want to have a beard, you got the rest of you guys are wannabes. No beard. I, I gave him a, a lot of, lot of and I never had curfews. It's the best player always gets caught in the curfew. <laughs> Because the best player will get caught, and I can't afford that. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a, look, a, and lot guys, a lot of guys would say this. They'd say they'd be walking down the hall, one on one. You come in the other way, and they're going this way, and they, and you just walk right by them. You wouldn't say a word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the point of it is now whatever Herb's method to his madness, which we understand. Yeah. But from a kid, a 19 year old kid. When he witnesses that, he's going to have his own interpretation of that, that that's coming from a child. That's, that's all I'm saying. That, and by the way, we're, we're in the good. That's actually quite good. It's because, great. Because the fact that you don't say anything keeps him scared. Right. <laughs> we're terrified. Yeah, I mean, right. he said it, and he goes, I'm still scared of her. And I'm, <laughs> I'm still scared of her. That's what he said. I'm still scared of the guy. What was your feeling about, uh, in terms of loneliness, uh, in terms of the team out there, 
Yeah, well, and what you had, what you had done, and at that moment, I mean, was it a, was it a bit of a blur then? Or? Yeah, I can't go back. But you know, it was, you know, it was very emotionally for me. It was a very emotional moment, and uh, so I just, I just was, I was off by myself, uh, and you know, just a, you know, a, a reflecting type thing. But you know, in, in, in retrospect, I mean, this was. The whole thing about this whole thing was it was a team that accomplished something, not in the little individuals. And to give credibility to that, this team won all the major sporting awards. The, the, the top event of the last 100 years was given to a team. Uh, Sports Illustrated Sportsman of the Year Award was given to a team. Uh, the ABC Sportsman of the Year was given to a team. All the sporting awards of that year, and the biggest one of the last heart, was given to a team. It was not given to an individual. So it, this is what I was trying to build as a team, all right? And so that is probably the most gratifying thing to me, to have a group being recognized as opposed to Michael Jordan. Great athletes, they're all great young athletes, but it was the synergy that that transform their talents into something else. And that's what I was trying to do.